Welcome to episode 36 of the Hoop Threads podcast. I'm here with uh, some esteemed members of the local DMV media. I uh, kind of wanted to bring a round table together to discuss their careers and then also uh, to talk a little bit about high school and college hoops. So uh, let's start with Ant. Uh, just introduce yourself. Uh, let, let people know where they can find you on social media. All right. My name is Anthony Haney III. Uh, currently, I work at Team 980 um, over near Nats Park. Um, you can find me on Twitter at Anthony Haney 3. Haney is spelled H A Y N I E. Um, yeah, pretty much everything. Cool. Marcus? Uh, Marcus Helton, editor in chief at DMVElite.com. And you can find me on Twitter. Uh, it's pretty easy. It's just my name at Marcus Helton. <laughs> Yeah, we got to spice that up, Marcus. Uh, <laughs> Mark, what you got? Mark Stern. Uh, I run Capital Hoops. My Twitter is at Capital Hoops. <laughs> Video extraordinaire in the DMV. All right, gentlemen. So we're going to start with Ant first. Um, just kind of talk about, you know, brief uh, summary of your career, kind of like how you got to where you're at. Maybe some good decisions you made, you know, picking one internship over another or something like that, that they got you to where you're at. All right. So I've been at Team 980 since December 2018. Um, but before I got there, I was working as a, a financial analyst's assistant at Morgan Stanley. But I didn't go to school for, you know, finance and things of that nature. I went to school for uh broadcast and digital journalism. So that's what I was trying to get into, but I was having a tough time once I, when I graduated. And then one of the prep coaches, uh, EJ Johnson, he put me in contact with Mark. So at first I started working with Mark and I was just covering all the local high school basketball games because I had nothing to do, you know, um, as a, a, a graduate of college. Um, and then my boss from Morgan Stanley, he actually put me in contact with the PD at Team 980. And that's how I got involved at Team 980. Um, and there, I was a board op at first. You know, I just had to get my foot in the door, to be honest. Um, and I used that to climb my way up to where I am now. I'm a full-time producer um, for the Travis Thomas show. Um, but yeah, I was a board op. Uh, and then I started doing the digital content for Team 980, working on the website, doing videos. Um, and then from there, I stepped in as a, a producer, but I was still part-time. And then I just stuck it out. I stuck it out and it took me until, you know, now, actually I just got promoted last week to full-time producer. So um, you, for real, for you just gotta thug it out, get your foot in the door and ask people that are you know already there how they can help you um one of the people that helped me was b mitch and doc work doc walker they were always you know in my ear telling me to yo you need to pay attention to that you need to uh, come in and try hard and just trying to give me advice to be honest so yeah cool, cool. recent graduate of syracuse university as well we got three out of four uh panelists came from su too so good to <laughs> some, some more yes, sir. all right so marcus tell us about your journey uh, well, I did not go to Syracuse. <laughs> uh, I went to Western Maryland College, which is now McDaniel College, small division three school, played football there. I graduated and got a job uh, as a newspaper writer. And I worked as, uh, you know, covering high schools and colleges in Harrisonburg, Virginia, where James Madison University is located. Um, I moved to the DMV in 2010 when my first daughter was born because my wife is from here and she wanted to come home. So I left my newspaper job and I came up here and um, I didn't really know anyone. I hooked up with a gentleman named Chris Lawson who, who was running a company called DMV Elite. It was just doing like a uh, small kind of showcase games, travel ball. They didn't really have any kind of media. So he gave me the keys to, to do that and uh, kind of built that up to where it is now 10 years later. Um, what was the other part of your question? Uh, just kind of any advice that you have for, for people kind of coming up in, in your field. Got you. I guess one of my biggest things would be just get out and work. Like I said, when I came up here, I didn't really know anyone. Um, I just went out to different games, different teams, introduced myself. Like, you know, it's cliche to say you got to grind, but that's really what you got to do. Like, just get out, be seen, show people that you're willing to work. 
and you know, good things will happen to you. Cool. Cool. Mark. Uh, graduated from Syracuse in 2003. Uh, I was born here, came back home after, after college, worked for the Washington Wizards for about four years doing corporate sales. And uh, it wasn't all that fulfilling. I didn't, I wasn't really connected with basketball, which was what I really <clears throat> wanted to be. Um, you know, I wanted to be more connected with the game. So a gentleman, a guy by the name of Tim Chalastri actually started and founded Capital Hoops. And I was a big fan of like the content he was putting out there. And I reached out to him and, you know, we just kind of chatted here and there. And then I don't know how it came about, but he asked me if I'd be interested in kind of like covering some games for him part time. So for a year or so, I would just go to a game or two every week, the same way, same thing Anthony was doing for me, basically. And he was a younger guy, but he had like four or five kids and he just couldn't support himself doing capital hoops. So he told me that he was going to sell the company and move on to do something else professionally that would bring in more income. And I told him that I wanted to buy the company from him. So I did that. And, uh, you know, the last 10, 11 years, I've just spent trying to grow it and, you know, keep up with Marcus Helton and, uh, <laughs> Um, you know, I don't know. It's been, it's been great. It's been, uh, it's been a lot of fun. Um, you know, I feel like I make a difference to some degree, which is self-rewarding and, uh, you know, it's a lot of fun. I mean, I've, I've met a lot of great people and I've, you know, a lot of great relationships I've formed through this basketball stuff. And, uh, I mean, it's, it's like a glorified passion project to some degree. It doesn't bring in a lot of money, but I'm, I'm fortunate because I've got my hands in a couple other businesses that are a little more financially rewarding that allows me to do what I love with this. So, um, yeah, that's my story. Cool. Cool. All right. Let's talk about, you know, the impact that, that COVID has, has had on, you know, sports in our area. Um, you know, the difficulties, you know, some, some, you know, public schools not being able to play, uh, you know, private schools like the one I work for having a very limited schedule. I think we only played 11 games this year. We normally play, you know, upwards of, of 30. Um, talk about kind of, <clears throat> uh, and then also, I mean, Marcus, when we get to you, kind of also speak on the, the difficulty in running events, because I feel like you're kind of getting it from both sides. You got one side that's like, come on, do something for the kids. You know, they're, they're in this, this rough spot. And then there's, people that are more health conscious that are worried about, you know, the, the exposure and stuff like that. So go ahead, Ian. Um, COVID has really gotten in the way. <laughs> uh, but so I'm, I'm a coach at Georgetown prep and I haven't really even done too much. Well, I'm a JV coach. I haven't done too much. Um, as far as like the team has gone, um, there's a limited amount of people that can be in the gym and on the court at Georgetown prep. So those, you know, tight stipulations prevent a lot of, you know, coaching and just being able to try to de develop the, um, the players that you have there and ultimately even build connections. Um, we have a kid right now, Kanai Roots, who has not played a single high school basketball game and, oh. I'm not going to lie. I've been on the court with him. He is very talented, like super talented. He, he can do it all. He can dribble, he can shoot and get to the basket. It's a little scary. And he was just offered, um, he was just offered by Georgetown. And my thing is, had he been able to, you know, use his freshman year and grow like the growing pains that you have as a freshman and sophomore compared to when you're a junior and senior, two totally different things. Um, and he hasn't had that experience or that luxury. So I think when it comes to like the development of, you know, younger players is definitely a barrier. And then when you, when you think about the juniors and seniors who are still trying to gain exposure, um, who may be that diamond in the rough um, late in their career, they're, they're getting the short end of the stick. So I think it's just, it's really tough. And, I think before COVID, I think a lot of players often found themselves in bad situations at a university that, that may not have fit them. And I feel like a lot of universities are going, are going to go out on the limb and, you know, 
may br- bring in a player that may not uh, fit their system, but you, you can't really know until you see them on the court. And we haven't had that, you know, availability to have those players on the court and show what they have. Marcus? Yeah, I mean, just building off what Anthony was saying, like, it's, it's thrown so much chaos and everything. Like, I have, I'll have, i um, have college coaches ask me about a kid, and, you know, at this point, I might, I might not have seen that kid in a year now. Like, I, I have no idea what how much he's improved. I, I haven't seen, you know, last year when the, when the pandemic shut everything down, you know, right at the end of the season before the start of the travel ball, like – everyone knows how that process kind of goes. Like, you know, there's always a couple kids who blow up in the spring and the summer. And yeah. yeah, there's been a whole class of guys who just had that taken from them. So, you know, all those guys who would have gone into this season, you know, putting themselves on the radar, didn't get a chance to do that at all. So, you know, um, I'm sure it's really disappointing for them. And like, like Anthony was saying, uh, when it comes to college coaches recruiting, you've got guys who are, they're, they're offering guys and taking commitments from guys they've never seen in person or have never been on campus. So, I mean, what are the ripple effects from that (laughs) either down the road? You see how, uh, you know, popping the transfer transfer portal is right now. I can't even imagine next year. We crazy next year. Right. (laughs) Yeah. Well, like I'm saying, it's it's one of those things. It's just, we're all trying to get through it. We're all trying to figure out how to get through it. Um, But it's just, it's caused so much chaos and everything. Talk about the events too. Yeah, like you said, that's one of those things. Like I go back and forth on it myself. So it's not you see, some people are like, "Oh, you got to get these events going," and other people are like, "You should probably chill on some events." <laughs> like I'm conflicted myself sometimes. Um, you know, I had my own COVID battle a couple weeks ago, uh, so I know how much it sucks. And luckily, I was one of the fortunate ones who got over it. Um, but you know, it, it's tough because you got to figure out, you know. What are the protocols? How many teams can we have in the gym? How many people can you have in the gym? Um, what are the best ways to get it to the people, you know, via live stream or video who can't be there? Um, and I, I do think that it's beneficial to a lot of the kids. Like right now we've been running a, a varsity league for, you know, some high school teams and some are travel teams. And, uh, you know, they're all really appreciative of the fact that they get to do something uh, as opposed to, you know, sitting home and not playing. <laughs> So, yep. I mean, that's one of those things I go back and forth on, um, but it's tough and it's thrown a whole series of, uh, you know, issues into running events. Yeah. Yeah. Mark? I mean, yeah, I agree with everything that everyone else has said. COVID is such an unprecedented thing that there's no, like, there, there's just, there's no playbook for it. Everyone has to kind of make up their, their mind on the fly and, and just try to put their best foot forward. And it's, it's just, it's, it's just such a rare, it's such a strange, weird thing that it's, 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 you know, a lot of people don't see eye to eye on it. Um, you know, some people think COVID is like a joke to some degree. Some people have loved ones who have died from COVID. So you have like complete opposite ends of the spectrum that are kind of conflicting. I mean, you, like I've talked to a coach in Baltimore who's like, Yes, there are people dying from COVID, but there's more people dying from like violence because of like, I don't want to, I don't remember exactly how he phrased it, but it's not cabin fever, but like, there's just, there's nothing going on up there that people in Baltimore city, like the murder rate has spiked so much since COVID started. Um, I I, I'm, I'm not, I don't fully remember the conversation I had with him, but he thinks basketball needs to be restored because people are, are doing other things that they shouldn't be doing. You know what I'm talking about, Marcus? No, I've heard, yeah, I've heard a lot of that too. Heard yeah. So, so in Baltimore city, a lot of coaches are like pushing really hard to have basketball back because the, the kind of the, the, the secondary things from COVID are, are, you know, are really messing things up up there, which is understandable. So, everyone has a different viewpoint on it and it's, it's just hard to, to meet in the middle, so to speak. It's really, really difficult to like appease everybody. So I don't know. I don't know. I don't know where I stand. I mean, I have people asking me every day if we're going to be doing summer league this summer and you know, I don't know how I feel about that. I really want to do it. I know 
I know everyone wants to do it, but there's also this like health and safety issue. Obviously, Dematha has the final say if we're going to have it at Dematha. So there's there's that aspect of it. I I don't know. I mean, I I think it's great that there has been basketball to some degree. I mean, I've really enjoyed covering the limited games that there that there have been. So it's been it's been really good to give some exposure to some kids that you know I don't that 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 really needed it. Um, you got a lot of kids like from Montgomery County public schools, for example, have transferred to schools like the two Rock Creek schools and Avalon and other private, the limited private schools that are playing. So it's kind of cool to see some of these kids get an opportunity that they couldn't get playing in the MPSSAA. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't have a great, I don't have a really good answer for your question. It's just, it's such a, it's such an unprecedented thing that, that I don't know. I'm with Marcus. I'm always conflicted. I had COVID too. I had COVID really early and I had a really mild case of it. So my viewpoint on it might be different from people who like really, I think Marcus had a fairly difficult battle with it. So it, you know, it's a, it, we probably, I don't know. I mean, I think COVID is very serious, but for me, if I had a really tough case of it, I'd probably be a little more reserved and a little more hesitant because I saw firsthand what it did to me. I didn't really have, you know, that experience. So maybe I'm not as skewed when it comes to my thoughts on it, but I don't know. I mean, I think it's great that the vaccines are somewhat prevalent now and it seems like they're going to be like coming out in full throttle pretty soon to everybody. So that should, you know, get things kind of, kind of back on track to some degree. Let's talk real quick. I mean, this one's kind of more for Marcus and then, and maybe Mark, but, um, Let's talk real quick about what Marcus was touching on with the transfer portal. Um, and, you know, kind of what do we think is the root cause of, of it becoming a record number every year? Um, and maybe what are some ways that we can kind of alleviate, you know, the, the massive numbers that are going in there every year? Because, I, I mean, I don't think anyone thinks that it's good for college basketball. <laughs> um. I think the cat's out the bag, man. Like, I really don't know. <laughs> like, I don't know what they can do at this point. Yeah. Um, I think it's great that players have the freedom now to, to move around. They don't need, you know, uh, the, it was a nightmare for some guys trying to get releases. Mm. Um, so I, I think from that part, it, it's done well. I just don't know what, like I said, next year, I can't even imagine. <laughs> like, I, I, after everything that's happened with COVID and uh, some commitments everyone's getting, like, mm. I, I really don't know. And like at this point, like uh, guys are free to move. And, and you add on to that, the fact that everyone has an extra year of eligibility onto that. It's like yeah. you parlay those things together and it's just like, it's going to be like, <laughs> it's going to be the wild, wild west. Right, right. A lot of red shirts. <laughs> I mean, I think it's uh, the, the point that I try to make when I've talked about this with people is, it's really unfortunate and it's more in my head cause I'm a high school coach, but um, it, it's really unfortunate how the, the high school senior class really seems to be a loser in every situation, every rule that's come about, you know, they did the scholarship thing, which is nice for the college kids, but now college coaches are like, why would I recruit a freshman point guard when I can bring back, you know, my four year starter. Um, and uh, you know, and that's something very real. You know, I've talked to a couple of friends, the coach at the college level and they're like, yeah, we may dip into the transfer portal, but I mean, if we have pretty much the same team coming back next year, there's no reason to, you know, bring in any new faces, um, especially, you know, if next year's, you know, shortened because of COVID again. Um, and it's just really unfortunate that there, I really don't think there's been a ton of concessions made um, for high school kids. And like, I, I talked to a couple people about, I just think that there should be like maybe an extra scholarship created just for this class, um, just for high school kids. Um, just to boost the recruitment um, of, of kids. I mean, there's, you know, like there, there's two seniors on DeMathis team that I think in a normal year with, you know, 35 games versus, you know, the 11 that we played, uh, two scrimmages um, that, that would have more options to choose from. Um, and when you talk about generational impact, I mean, that, that can be huge. So kind of unfortunate to see it go down like, like that so all right let's let's end it with a couple fun questions so um this is fresh in my mind it's really random uh but i watched the fab five documentary uh, uh today and uh 
what would that experience be if it happened today? You know, what would be some of the differences? What would be some of the similarities? I think social media would definitely just <laughs> – Twitter would be shut down uh, during during their games against against Duke and stuff like that. So kind of talk about what you think it would look like today and, you know, if things would be different or, or the same. Go ahead, Ant. I think it wouldn't be bad. I, th- I, th- I think since the world is so much more progressive and – and how, uh, you know, they're allowing athletes to, you know, speak out and use their voice, their platform. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it would have been good for the uh, the game of basketball in terms of, you know, all right, I got, I got to, I got to gather my thoughts. Uh, <laughs> I mean, there's definitely a, a section of, of college fans that would be the same as, as, you know, guys back then, maybe not as utterly racist and terrible, but still people that are saying, you know, the game should be played this way, you know, not really liking like the brash style and, and, and some of that. But, um, and I wonder if, if social media would swing that in a positive direction or <laughs> in a negative direction. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> <social> media. <laughs> Basketball Twitter is definitely a very divided world for sure. So uh, go ahead, Marcus. So, I mean, are you talking about if now was like the kind of environment where people weren't really used to that many freshmen, like freshmen playing such a key role? If if that team, like if if we erase the history books and there, you know, freshmen didn't play, you know, at a high level or they didn't play very often college basketball. So you bring all that revolutionary stuff to now. What would that that look like? Uh, Like you said, it would definitely blow up social media. Yeah. Um, It it would make them the team to watch. Just like, you know, now how things are now whenever – Kentucky brings in five five star guys or whatever they do. Yeah, uh, I think it'd be similar to that. They'd have the microscope on them the entire time. Um, you know, championship or bust kind of mentality for them, even even with a bunch of 18, 19 year old kids. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I think it's the kind of thing that you know will get a whole lot of attention. Yeah. Know, deservedly or not. Cool. Yeah, you got some or. Yeah, to be honest, I didn't understand what your question was. <laughs> but going off like what Marcus was saying, um, social media would definitely make light of, you know, five freshmen, African American at that, being uh, literally the the center of college basketball. Um, I feel like everyone would tune in. I feel like through social media, the fact that we have Slam Magazine, we have Capital Hoops, we have, you know, all these media outlets to get exposure from these rising um, freshmen and just, like, see highlights of these players. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Zions of the world, the Jalen Greens of the world, the Kate Cunningham of the world, we live for those moments. So to be able to see them every every night or just, you know, on prime time uh, TV, we would would cherish that for real, for real. Mm -hmm. Mark? So I actually see it differently from everyone. Um, I think if the Fab Five was around right now, like we see teams like the Fab, like the Fab Five in terms of their youth so much these days. I think it was so unique and so different back then because you didn't see teams that were so like freshman heavy at that point. But every year, the Dukes, the Kentuckys, all the big dogs are all all freshmen. Now, what Ant was mentioning about, you know, five African-Americans and the landscape from like a racial, from, from that aspect of it was different back then. But I think from just like a basketball perspective, I think right now, if there was a team that had five freshmen came in and they were dominant and they ran the table or they got to the championship game or whatever, I think that kind of just like fits what college basketball is these days. Most of the really good schools are all freshmen. So I mean, social media would gravitate towards it because social media is just like thirsty and they gravitate towards everything. But I don't, <laughs> I don't think, I don't know. I, I don't think it would be nearly as crazy in this day and age as it was 20, 25 years ago when that was such a rarity, you know? Right. I don't know. That's what I meant when I was asking like what, what the environment is around it. Like if you were talking about a time period where no one really, where, where it didn't happen. Right, right, right. But like you said, yeah, now people are used to it. Like I said, yeah. Duke and Kentucky and schools bring in blue chip it was, guys. It was just, it was, so, it was so unique back then that it like, it's still, people still think of it as this, 
this like phenomenon or whatever you want to call it because we had never seen it before and we didn't really see it after that for a while until I don't know, 10 years ago or whenever the whole freshman thing became such a all apart to Kentucky normal scene. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. All right. So um another fun one, kind of talking about, you know, the G League and Night team has really ignited no pun intended, ignited a lot of interest in the G League this year. Um you know, just a lot more friends kind of actually watching that level of basketball. Um, and I think it's been successful. Um, if you're Sharif Abdurrahim, uh, what, you know, two or three high school players are you inviting to, to next year's G League in 19? Start with Ant. You said three players or? Two or three or one. If you got one, then we'll go with that. <laughs> All right. So I would love to see J.D. Davison in uh, the G League. I feel like that dude is so athletic. Like he wows me every time I see him hoop. Um, and actually, when I was at PJM, I uh, I got to see him. I didn't know he was a junior though when I had uh, saw him hmm. um, that summer. I thought he was a senior, but he wowed me then. And I feel like uh, him playing the highest competition um, down at PJM it would sort of like swing over also to the G League. Um, I mean, he would get a coach and, you know, have other players, you know, help with his development. But I, I would like to see him over there. And, you know, Chad Hungerman as well. He hasn't committed to anywhere yet. Um, but that dude is seven feet, can do it all. I would just love to see him, um, you know, bypass college and, you know, try try uh, and get better and, and stronger. That's definitely something he's going to have to uh, work on um, if he wants to go to the league. Um, and then, yeah, probably those two players. Cool. Marcus? Uh, I mean, Chet Homer is a name that jumps out. And uh, I mean, I might be wrong on this. He's, has he been on record as saying he's not doing it? Someone, I know he's been asked. I, I don't think any of them have, have commented on whether or not they're going to do it or if they've been offered it. I think last year, if I remember right, it was really – like after the college season had ended yeah. that, that they came out and said, we've offered, you know, we've extended an offer to this player uh, to, to play in the G league. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, besides him, uh, Caleb Houston's a guy I really like. I was mm -hmm. able to see him in person for the first time, uh, you know, a couple of months ago. Um, he's one I would definitely keep an eye on. Uh, Jaden Hardy is another one. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Probably those, those probably be my top three. Mark. Um, the kid Paulo Bonchero from Seattle. Yes, mm -hmm. Yep, Seattle Rotary. Yes, sir. Yeah, we saw and we saw him at Peace Jam. Oh, you you were there too, Aaron. Yeah, he was. Oh man, he was he was special. He's killing. Um, He's athletic as hell. I mean, all the guys. You know, if you look at the rankings, all these guys in the top ten are are you know are are great candidates for this. Um. I mean, I'm always kind of biased to the DMV. I would love to see a guy like Trevor Keels. I was about to ask, yeah. <laughs> I mean, he's, he doesn't have, like, the flash and, like, the crazy athleticism that, you know, that a lot of these guys have. But from, like, a selfish, you know, for, like, if you're asking me what I would personally like to see, I would love to see Trevor Keels, hmm. you know, compete, compete at that level. But I'd also love to see Trevor Keels be, like, a, a main player on a, on a top 10 college team playing like in March. So, you know, I'm, I'm conflicted on this because I, I don't necessarily think this is like the optimal path for a kid to take either. Um, so I don't know. I think, you know, all, all the kids that are atop the rankings are, are certainly good candidates for something like this. So I have, I have a few, uh, I mean, Paulo Benchero is the one that really stands out to me. I just, it, it's, it's kind of like you just watch his game, you know, 6'10", can, can shoot it, can put it on the floor, uh, can score down low, can score from the perimeter. Um, so Jaden Hardy, Paolo Banchero, uh, Michael Foster, um, who's right right now he hasn't committed anywhere. I think the G League is actually openly uh, in his final three. Um, A.J. Griffin that's going to Duke. And then the last one, um, kind of a, a sneaky candidate, would be uh, Ty Ty Washington um, that – has been cooking um, the buck. Uh, out west for uh, Compass Prep. Um, I just, it would be really interesting for me to see Ty Ty 
at that level because you're playing against grown men and he is a skinny dude. Um, I wonder, you know, if that would be better for, for his, um, for just down the line for his game. Uh, I, th- I think it would be interesting to see how, it, how he would do against, you know, NBA veterans, you know, cause a lot of them have dropped down from the league uh, that are playing at that level. But yeah, I was going to ask the follow-up question about Trevor Keels. Cause I mean, I think he could definitely play at that level. Um, it would be interesting, you know, athleticism wise to see, you know, how he would fare uh, at that level. He's definitely improved his body in the past year. I mean, he's lost, I think at least 10, 15 pounds easy uh, during the pandemic. Um, so, all right, last question. Um, talking about the amateur league uh, that's being uh, put together. Um, what, what What's the organization behind that? It's not ball is life. Overtime. Um, overtime. Good time. Uh, talk about that league. Uh, you know, if, personally, I'm, I'm just going to give my opinion first. Uh, I don't, I'm dubious about where they're going to come up with the money to give hundred K to every player uh, minimum. <laughs> they were, they were saying like, that would be the minimum. Uh, so that implies that, you know, the elite players, if they got them would, would be paid more. Um, it just kind of seems like a LeVar ball uh, <laughs> J league type idea. Um, I don't really, if it's not, you know, professional coaches that you're bringing in and it's not, you're, you're not being developed at that level. I think that college is kind of the way to go. Um, and if, if not college, you know, you could do something where, you, you know, dares Baisley, you know, you're sitting out for the year and, you know, working with the trainer already signed with an agent that's kind of providing, you know, housing and all that stuff. Um, I don't really see that being successful. I don't really see a, a, a a league like that being successful without the backing of the NBA or the NCAA and the NCAA is obviously not going to put that together if it's in direct competition with, you know, what they have going on. So, uh, and what are your thoughts on that league for me? Uh, I actually just looked up this league. I hadn't heard of it. (laughs) Really? (laughs) No, I have not heard of it. You live under a rock over there? (laughs) No. It was all, it was all the buzz last weekend. Yeah. Oh, last weekend. Last week they were talking about it. I think yeah, they made an announcement like last week, right? Yeah, two weeks ago somewhere. In, yeah, it's, it's been. Yeah. A week. I, yeah. I I don't. I think I heard about it over the weekend. Yeah, but yeah, I don't. I don't like you were saying, uh, Aaron. Like I don't know. I don't know where they pull. Where, like where do they get this pool of players from? <laughs> like how do you like? There's not that many guys who fit the criteria, um, in my opinion, to you know to fit in there. Like I don't know how you fill a league with that. So I don't, yeah. So I don't know if it's a league. I thought I read that it was a team. Okay, I mean, and they were gonna like travel around and play against prep teams. I, I mean, there was not a lot of information out about it, but it seemed like I, I was against it for sure. But there wasn't enough information to really have like all the facts. Um, you know, my chief concern when I heard about it was, is this about like developing basketball players or is this just like about having a bunch of dudes in the gym that can dunk and cross people up and like is it more like content like i'll chase it yeah (laughs) yeah, is is it more is it more about like having great content and letting these guys financially capitalize off of the great content or is it about like grooming them to play like on the professional level one day i mean is it more of like a harlem globetrotters like entertainment make money type thing or is it like let's get these guys ready for the highest level of basketball and it's i don't know from what i saw the answer to that question was not clear i mean even if it's you know one one team situation it's like how is you know prep school level basketball better than you know division one level basketball you know because the the players that at least that they're saying that they're going to target are kind of high level players and it's just like i don't understand how that would be, you know, developmentally, how that would be beneficial for them. So, but, all right, guys. But is, but is developmental, like, I think the, the main question is, is the developmental aspect of it, like, is that paramount? Is that the most important thing? Or like a 15 year old tennis player who's a professional who has the opportunity to go make seven figures or however much they can make, like mm-hmm. they can do it. And should a basketball player not have that option? And this is like just another avenue to that. I, I don't know. I mean, I feel like everyone here is kind of against it, and I am too. But there's definitely like another side to the coin. 
Right. I mean, I'm saying like on C- CBS, they're saying uh, it's going to offer high school basketball players an alternative to college in preparation for the NBA. It'll begin in September 2021 and feature 30 of the nation's top prospects from age 16 to 18 who will be given a guaranteed minimum salary of $100,000 in addition to bonuses and equity in the league. 16 to 18? Yeah, are there 30 guys? You can, <laughs> I can't even think of 30 guys who fit the... But it, it used the word league in that? It so said league with 30 guys. So what, yeah, so what does that even mean? Is it like... Three, three, is it three, like, three. like a, is it like a pickup league? Like every every week they just like make new teams on the fly. <laughs> every team has five players. <laughs> I don't know. It seems really weird. And then what about like the scholastic component to yeah, it? Yeah, right. Players that participate in the league will forfeit their eligibility to play high school or college basketball. Right, right. right. But it said that there was there's something in there about scholarship money. Like I think like a hundred yeah. you know, mm-hmm. for his education. Um, all right, so the the last question that I'm kind of springing on you guys, and, we'll, and then we'll get out of here. Um, give me, you know, a, a hot take that you have about, you know, either a player or a team uh, for this next season, or you know, a player that you think is going to make a huge jump um, next year. So to to give you guys uh, a second to gather your thoughts and, and think of something. Um, mine is mine is. Mine is mine is definitely a homer pick. I think Tyrell Ward is is going to be a five star. Um, the the leaps and bounds, the improvement that he's made this past season, um, growing from six five to like just under six eight. I think he's at about six seven, six eight now. Um, several times he goes up and gets a rebound, you know, off the top of the backboard, and just is the one man fast break. You know, and ends with his legs flying in the air as he throws down the dunk. Um, he just, you know, accepts coaching at a much higher level, became a leader for this year's team, uh, plays really hard, uh, works really hard in practice. Um, I just really think that the the sky is the limit for this kid. And I don't know where he's ranked right now. I think it was like 58 or 48 uh, the last time I checked, but um, I, I don't think there's 40 players better than him in the country personally. But yeah, like I said, definitely, definitely biased. So uh, and we'll go to you, you next on this. Mine's is biased as well. I want to say Canal Roots. I haven't seen this kid yet, but when you do, I promise you, it is must-see TV. Um, the kid, I want to say last spring, he was about six feet. He's grown seven inches, and he still has his guard skills, shooting ability. He's six seven now? Yes, he's six seven. Damn. Six seven. He's dunking on people. He <laughs> he he's playing with the varsity players. And to be honest, I want to say he's the best player on the court. <laughs> I lied to you. I want to say he's the best player on the court. Yeah. But um, yeah. Just remember the name. I, I promise you. Remember the name. Yeah, that so that dude for New World. He can, I, he can, I've seen him with New World. He can play. I saw. I saw. You, him you saw football. six foot one Kana. You haven't seen <laughs> six seven. <laughs> Running down on the break, dunking like you ain't seen that yet. Yeah. All right, Mark. Uh, you know, a, a guy who I think would have ripped like everybody would be talking about uh, if he'd had like a full spring and summer. Um, and he's played a couple games right now and he's showing out. But you guys know uh, Cam Whitmore at Spalding. Mm, yeah. yeah. I think he's one of like the best. Getting back to that uh, 2022 class that Ty, um, that is in. I think he's one who everyone will be talking about you mm. know, <laughs> under normal cir- circumstances. Yeah. He's, he's, he's going to be an absolute monster. His, his entire freshman year, he was out with the, the leg injury too, right? Yeah, he's bounced back. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. He's definitely bounced back. I've seen, I've seen, a, couple right, right. Had, I've seen a couple of dunks he had in the limited uh, games I've, they've been playing this year. So, Mark, uh, close it out for us. So, so – so a kid who I've seen a fair amount over the past couple months, who I'm just so impressed with every time I see him play, is Brian Iafor on Rock Creek. Um, he went to Blake. He actually played in the summer league at Damatha for Blake High School. Yep. And he has improved. This kid, I don't know. Have, have any of you guys seen him play recently or this year? Yeah, I heard he's been cooking up at St. James. He's playing, he's playing in the league we're doing with uh, DMV Sports Academy. I think this kid is so good. He uh, he can do a lot. I mean, he's a big, but he's – he's. I mean, he plays a big kind of because of his size, but he can shoot the ball. He's an elite defender. 
super athletic. I, I, I mean, I think he's definitely a Division One player. I'm not going to sit up here and, and say my guy is a top 50 guy in the country because I, <laughs> I like to go against the grain a little bit. But uh, Brian Brian Iafor is my uh, my one to watch. Yeah, he got an offer a couple weeks ago on Virginia State. I want to say. Yeah, I think he might have two. Um, yeah, I think he picked up one this weekend too. Good, good. So, I appreciate it. Well, Aaron, 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 before we go, can we ask you a question or two? Sure can. I feel like it's my duty since I kind of like brought you to the DMV that I asked you a couple questions. <laughs> you sure you did. Hot, put you in the hot seat. You so, sure did. So how many episodes of this podcast have you done? So this is episode uh, 36 of this podcast. So aside from Jay Billis, because we know that's going to be the answer if I don't preface <laughs> the question by saying aside from, what has been what has been like the most exciting episode that you've done? <sighs> actually pulling up the episode list right now so i can i can peep through that um so i think the most informative one that i knew was going to be good but i didn't know how good it was going to be uh was was stan jones uh with florida state um the dude is just forgotten more than most of us know about the game um and he's just an incredible teacher uh, you know, just from our conversations with him. Um, and I, I just learned a ton, you know, selfishly, you know, the point of this podcast is to try to um, put, put young people on the path and, and learn from um, people's mistakes or, or, you know, positive choices that, that led them to where they are in their career. Um, but also, I mean, selfishly, it's just for me to pick up information from, you know, different basketball minds or, you know, people, uh, you know, videographers or people in the media. Um, I just think that uh, learning from all those different angles has been fun. So, yeah, he's he's been a Division One assistant coach for, I think, 27 years, something ridiculous like that. Um, and then the most fun one was – uh, sorry, Mark. Uh, <laughs> the most fun one was probably the one with Ray and Ibn was a lot of fun. Um, just the stories that they had. I didn't know like the, the caliber of player that Ray was, um, you know, back in the day, you know, he, when he was playing for Roosevelt, um, you know, I, I was talking to Doug uh, with, with takeover and he's like, man, he, he was one of the next ones. Uh, you know, he, he grew up playing with and against Ty Lawson um and uh and it had a had a really cool story about uh when ray was basically training him and you know he said he was you know up at up at college up at iona and it, it was calling back you know complaining all oh, this coach ain't playing me this and that and ray was like yo you with the bullshit right now like get in the gym like get off my phone <laughs> and uh so i picked up a lot of good info from that um but it's it's been really interesting there's been some guys like you know um like coach like Stan Jones, like I didn't really know him that personally. Um, he'd come into the gym for DeMath a couple of guy times and I, I followed him on Twitter and I think he followed me back. And I was just like, I mean, <laughs> God, may as well, you know, shoot my shot with that one. But um, it's, it's been great as far as networking goes, just to give me a reason uh, foot in the door to, to ask them questions about, uh, you know, their background and, and just kind of pick their brain about the game. So Are yeah. you ready for my next question. Oh, you got you got multiple questions. Oh, yeah, I got a couple for you. It's time, <laughs> right, we turn, so. it's time we turn the tables a little bit and ask you the tough questions. All how right. many how many times have you asked someone to be on the pod and they were just like, "Nah, I'm not feeling it." I'm not going to name him, but it's a local AAU coach that said he wanted to be on the pod. We talked for like 45 minutes the day before we we're supposed to go on the pod, and I got a bunch of great like information about his background. And then he just ghosted me. <laughs> so that, I mean, he didn't really tell me no. He just <laughs> was just like, yeah, I'm not interested. I don't really know what happened there. Uh, All right. Uh, how do you have, do you have like a, do you plan on doing this like indefinitely or is it something that you're going to do for a year or 50 episodes or a hundred episodes or. I always, I'm not the type of person to self promote. Um, but I always really enjoyed, you know, basketball conversations, you know, with you, with aunt, and with Marcus, with, you know, friends like Adam Mayalu and, you know, the, the prep hoops guys, Colby and Houston, and just, you know, debating basketball, talking about basketball, you know, 
you know, arguing, you know, greatest of all times teams and stuff like that. And I always just was interested in kind of creating a platform and it was just the, the middle of the pandemic. And I was like, I mean, I'm not doing much else right now. Um, and, uh, you know, my, my background, uh, education with, with, uh, my undergrad was actually professional writing. So, uh, I did do a good bit of interviewing and, um, stuff like that. So, I wouldn't say I have a knack for it, but it, it's definitely something that I enjoy. It's definitely a, a ton of fun, um, despite the the, the the amount of time it, it takes. It's definitely time consuming. I respect uh, Marcus Allen a lot more after doing some of this. <laughs> stuff. I'm like, man, this stuff takes a while when it comes to editing and, and everything like that. How long? How long will it take you from the time you start editing this till the time it's like a finished product on the on the on the airwaves? So round tables are a bit easier because it's normally just, you know, four or five questions. Um, it, it typically only takes me 20, 25 minutes to, I, I put in chapter markers for, for the time when I asked each question. Okay. Um, that's the most time consuming bit. And then I try to clip out, uh, you know, 30 seconds, a, a minute of, of audio for social media. And that, you know, that takes 20 minutes maybe. So it's, it's really not a ton of time. I honestly spend more time researching uh, the person I'm interviewing, uh, listening to interviews of that person, um, and just coming up with good questions and just running it by, you know, media people that I know to, to scan and let me know if there's anything, you know, that I need to ask this person. Or I always try to surprise each, each guest with the question uh, when, when they come on. So it's been fun. Aaron Proya, you're officially off the hot seat. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. I appreciate the time, gentlemen. Again, let, let the people know where they can find you on social media, and then we'll, we'll get out of here. It's your boy, Ant. You follow me at Anthony Haney 3. Anthony, H-A-Y-N-I-E 3. Marcus? Marcus Helton. Find me at Marcus Helton. Simple. Like I said, M-A-R-C-U-S-H-E-L-T-N. We're not letting you on the pod until you sauce it up. You got to, you got to come <laughs> with something. Man. I'm a simple man. Eh? Yes, yes, sir. Mark. Capital Hoops at Capital Hoops. Swoosh. <laughs> bang, bang, chicken and shrimp. All right, y'all. Uh, have a great day. Appreciate the time. Good to see you guys. Thanks, Aaron.